Good morning. Miss Mick is channeling her inner old white guy to introduce to you the founding fathers of educational theories and brain development. Okay. So you may pause this video to write down new learning. In fact, I insist. Pause, write down new learning. Brain development, all right, begins at birth with vision. Vision is being set up from birth to six months. Then we have motor development, prenatal through eight years. Motor development includes gross motor and fine motor. Emotional control is being formed from birth through three years. Vocabulary and speech is established birth to three years. Math and logical thinking is one to four years of age. These are when the foundations are being formed in the brain. That's why early childhood education is so important. Before preschool, there's already brain development and synapses forming. In the 2008 edition of the book, chapter four, in the new edition, from uh, her working with young children, windows of opportunity is appropriate stimulation is needed at certain times in childhood so that brain synapses form efficiently. Synapses is the brain wiring. Babies are born with a underdeveloped brain weighing about one pound. One pound? That's like one pound of hamburger? What? Okay. But their brain contains billions of specialized nerve cells called neurons. Each time a teacher or parent provides stimulation, a synapsis connects the neurons together, leading to active brain images. This change is called plasticity. So the plasticity of a brain is being developed in these early years, okay? And then they're just added on, added on, okay? So here is a picture, just so you understand, a baby born at 35 weeks and full term. So can you see the little face and the difference of the brain size? of four weeks, four, four and a half week difference. Wow. <clears throat> now, this is a baby in the womb. Look at the brain synapses of this little teeny tiny baby at six weeks in the mother's womb. It's known as an embryo, but we can already see the brain synapses forming. That's from the Time Magazine. This is kind of what's happening, the wiring of the brain. See these bursts? Every time we're teaching children, that's what's happening, okay? First old white guy. First old white guy, Erickson, okay? German-American sociologist, psychoanalyst. Let me tell you about him, okay? His psychosocial theory, see the old white guy, see, I'm channeling. Children need to form a healthy personality, which is emphasized by social and emotional aspects in response to their environment. Eight stages, but for ECE, we only focus on four. Again, this is in chapter four of the Working with Young Children textbook. One, the first, sorry, is trust versus mistrust. Birth to 18 months old, autonomy versus shame and doubt is 18 months through three years of old, three years of age, sorry. So let's pause for a minute, okay? Trust versus mistrust from birth to 18 months. So little babies are, are um, constantly 
have to be supported by adults. They have to trust that someone's going to change their diaper. Somebody is going to give me a bottle, right, and feed me. They can't do any of that on their own. So if they're not getting changed enough and not being fed, then they're learning to mistrust their environment. So that's kind of how these work against against each other or together. So as a 18 months to three years, they're going into that toddler stage, more independence. We want them to know how to uh, do things, right? And we want to nurture that independence. We don't want them to have shame and doubt, right? Like, no, stop that. Don't do that. We want to be teaching them autonomy, things that they can do. How can we, how do we want them to do it? Then, as they move to preschool three to five years old, you have initiative versus guilt. So preschoolers want to have, want to take initiative, okay? And if they think they've done something wrong, then we can make them feel really guilty. So we've got to turn things into teachable moments, positive reinforcement, right? What do we want them to do? Giving them initiative, letting them explore, right? They're learning to write their names for the first time. We want to Reward them for getting certain letters correct. Then we move into 6 to 12 years of age, industry versus inf inferiority. Okay, so you can pause. Pause anytime. Write this stuff down. Check your book, chapter 4. 6 through 12 years of age. So now they're learning to be part of that, you know, kindergarten, first through sixth grade. You know, like what is the industry? What is our society like? I'm learning to read and write, right? I'm finding my place. We don't want them to fear to um, fear us, right? Or feel inferior to us. We want them to feel productive. We want them to feel that they're part of our industry, part of our society, okay? Now, five to eight go through high school and adult education. He also said children have social emotional delays when one of the stages is not achieved positively by the age suggested. So Erickson says that if they're not having, if they're more dealing with mistrust in their life, shame and doubt, guilt, feeling inferior to adults, then they're going to struggle through the other stages. Okay, so he's saying it is, it is challenging to go back and try and redo these things. <clears throat> Next founding father, okay, is Jean Piaget, okay, Jean Piaget, it's, it's, um, Swiss, right, so we want to think of Target, but Target, Piaget, okay, that, we pronounce it a little bit differently than we see it, not Piget, Piaget, Jean Piaget, Swiss philosopher and psychologist, now, same book, chapter four, working with children, working with young children, schemata, mental representations or concepts, okay? So, schemata is a mental res representation of a concept. Adaptation is mentally organizing what they perceive in their environment. So, what's going on in their environment, children are making adaptations to. A simulation is the process of taking in new information and adding it to what the child already knows. Accommodation is adjusting what is already known to fit the new information, how you organize your thoughts and develop intellectually. Remember, cognitive equals thinking equals mental equals intellectual. Okay, so, and you can pause at any time to, to write some of these thoughts down. So this is what children are doing when they're playing and we're teaching them, right? And we're telling them what we want them to do and we're happy to see them and we're changing their diaper and we're feeding them and we're potty training them, right? We don't want them to feel shameful. We want them to feel productive. So his stages in the early childhood years are sensory motor, pre-operational and concrete operations. Concrete is very visual, okay? It can't be abstract, all right? It has to make sense. It has to have visuals to it. 
that's where young children are stuck. They need a lot of that hands-on. Okay? So that is Piaget. Now, another old white guy. They said he was white. I feel that he's like multiracial is Vygotsky. Right? But in his day and age, it was easier to just say, you know what? I'm an old white guy. Vygotsky studied under Piaget. All right? And I get him. I'm not, I'm not mad at the old white guys. I got you. You got to go to school, right? It was a different time in the world. But they did come up with some good stuff because they were able to study it. They got to study it and write the foundation of education. So Lev Vygotsky was Russian. And they always say that he um, was a non-religious uh, Jewish family. That was probably important to declare back in those days. Uh, working with young children again, um, chapter four. So like Piaget, who Vygotsky studied, both believed knowledge is built on previous experiences um, or knowledge, okay? So you learn something, and then you learn something new, and then you have to relate it to what you've already learned or what you already know, okay? Vygotsky believed children learn socially and culturally. So he added in this big social and cultural influence that Piaget really didn't touch on. He said that children, as we're learning, we go through self-talk, right? We either talk ourselves into putting the new learning with things we've already learned, or we just avoid it. Like we're just frustrated and we shut down. So we can have negative self-talk or we can have positive self-talk. He says that this is occurring in the zone of proximal development, the zone of proximal development. And there's scaffolding that takes place. So if you can see, Miss Mick has scaffolding steps here, right? So I know this much and then I'm getting older and I'm learning more math, more writing, and then I'm connecting that back. Sometimes I get frustrated, right? I don't want to go to the next step, right? But then I got to keep progressing, right? Take a step back, then I got to take two steps forward. Right, so kind of think of that scaffolding like steps, like a ladder, okay? And then that zone of proximal um, development, all right? And then you may have had a teacher use a KWL chart with you, what I already <coughs> know, excuse me, um, what I'm going to learn and then what I have learned, right? Or what questions do I have? So what do I know? What questions do I have? And then what am I going to end up learning? KWL. That is using a Vygotsky scaffolding technique. Howard Gardner, I'm going to go through briefly. He is the multiple intelligence guy. When Miss Mick first starts uh, with you, she has you complete a multiple intelligence survey developed from Howard Gardner. Howard Gardner is um, a um, new age founding father um, who said that intelligence is based more on, um, you know, a whole child's experience is not just their IQ test. Okay, so that would be his areas of intelligence, right, are bodily kinesthetic, musical rhythmic logical, math mathematical, excuse me, verbal, linguistic, interpersonal, intrapersonal, visual, spatial, and naturalistic. Okay, and this is in chapter four. And this is a review of one of my favorite, favorite theorists that um, I use in all of my classes. And I have everyone take a multiple intelligence survey to learn their area of strength based on Howard Gardner's theory. So he was born in 1943 in Pennsylvania, and he currently works with um, Harvard University. Okay, now Kohlberg is a newer uh, theorist as well. He lived in uh, New York, American, 1927 to 1983. His theory deals with morals, okay? A philosopher and student of child development. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was director of Harvard's Center for Moral Education. His special area is how children 
develop a sense of right, wrong, and justice. Okay, so um, he says that you're in a pre-moral, pre-conventional stage of self. He thinks this begins about age 10 because moral development is very abstract, right? So it kind of occurs after you, you know, like in those middle of your elementary school years, you start figuring out, okay, like, oh, you know, what's good versus evil, stuff like that. He says people um, or children, right, and people in general are motivated by anticipation of pleasure or pain. Okay, so he says it's a pre-moral or pre-conventional stage. Okay? All right. So, stage one, we're just going to talk a little bit about his stage one, is punishment and obedient. Might makes right. Okay? So, he says there should be avoidance of physical punishment and difference to power. Punishment is an automatic. The immediate, immediate physical consequence of an action determines goodness or badness, okay? So, what must I do to avoid punishment? What can I do? And then what can I do to be forceful upon others? So, he says that there's this moral, like, dilemma going on, Okay? And children are beginning to, between that 8 and 10 years of age, to figure out where they are morally. So he has, um, <clears throat> it'll, it should be interesting to see where it goes, where his theory goes, and, and how people, um, you know, write about his work. Like, for example, a new theorist, Carol Gilligan, um, she criticizes Kohlberg's theory. She says that women are socialized differently from men and that he only addresses from the male perspective with morals. He said women are usually um, more nurturing, uh, socially dictated. They have a concern for others and are developed in a, a different moral reasoning way. Okay. So he, she says, Gilligan, Carol Gilligan, let me, A period Carol Gilligan, okay? So she has, uh, was one of the first people to step out and um, speak, you know, that he's missing that female component, okay? So there's going to be many more theorists that take the founding fathers, right? And then we build off of them, okay? So we have to go with who was allowed to go to college when education systems um, were set up. And then we go from those theories. Okay. The last one I don't have written down is Maslow. Okay. M-A-S-L-O-W. Um, Maslow says that there's a hierarchy of needs that have to be met for a child to learn. So, for example... Um, children can't learn if they're hungry or tired, right? So this is why, um, like Columbus City Schools has programs, um, and other, um, school districts in areas of poverty where it, there's free breakfast, um, free breakfast for all, free lunch for all, right? So then kids can get access to some food because you can't learn if you're hungry and tired, Okay. All right, so that's Maslow. Okay, so I, I tried to speed through this. Hopefully, go back, pause, repeat, go back to chapter four, start thinking about these theorists and theories when you're watching children play and you're teaching them right from wrong, what your expectations are, what you want them to do. Think about how you're seeing some of these brain developing things going on, they're building synapses, their schema, their scaffolding happening. It can be an amazing experience. Okay, so Miss Mix Old White Guy is out. All right, hopefully, you paused and learned some new things on the way. Chapter four from the Working with Young Children book, guys, check it out.